Good morning and happy Sabbath. You are in advantage. You can see me and I cannot see you because the light is right in my face. <clears throat> that means I can say you all look good. <laughs> I'm glad to be with you here today. And um, it's a privilege not only to be together, but to know that God is here. If we would just think for a second, process that God is with his presence right here. And uh, that alone should make us happy and understand the privilege that we have. Uh, not to worry about things, but rather to worship God, to remember what he has done for us and what he will do for us. We'll talk about that a little more before we start. Let's bow our heads for another word of prayer. Father in heaven, we bow down in your presence and worship you. Angels, day and night, worship you. And Father, we don't understand what it means to come before you, but again, we thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. We thank you for the soon second coming, that we will see you face to face. And right now we pray that your spirit may open the world and touch every heart that we may see Jesus. We pray in Jesus' precious name and thank you. Amen. <clears throat> we believe, according to the Bible prophecies and looking around to all the events, we believe that Jesus is coming soon, sooner than we think. That's the reason the Bible says that it will be like a thief. Because people don't expect it. People say, well, it's spring and summer and fall <clears throat> and winter. Things are just the same. And people don't understand that the events show clearly that Jesus is actually coming. If you knew all the things that happen, we don't have time to go through the news. But it's not business as usual. And there are clear signs. I mean, many things happening uh, dismantling the separation between state and church. I could go on and on and on to a lot of things that are actually clear that when they happen, we have literally the final events in front of us. We are living those moments. And Jesus is coming, but the question is not when he is coming. The question is, are you ready? Because it would be very sad when he comes to hear the words, I don't know you. And how do you get ready? How do you prepare? How do you know that you love Jesus? It's so simple to sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Anybody can sing it. Satan can sing it. How do you know that you love Jesus? How do you measure that you love Jesus? Well, the Bible says in John, 1 John chapter 4, that if we don't love our neighbor that we see, and we think we love God, we are a liar. Basically, we are liars because we don't even know what love means and the love of God is not in us. We must love our neighbor because those are Jesus' children that he died for on the cross. And that's a big challenge. How do you love your neighbor? Moreover, if he's an enemy, I never told you the story. I'm gonna, it's not in our subject, but I'm going to tell you a quick story. I'm not sure if it's quick. I don't know how to tell it quick, but anyway... Uh, we moved from Kentucky to Maryland. And when we moved, we started to know our neighbors. And in the right side, it was a young family with a farm. Uh, he has a long beard, I mean, literally long. I mean, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but it was long. And they are good people, polite. Hey, neighbor, how are you doing? If you ever have a need, we'll be glad to help you. You know, visiting each other. I brought them some Swiss chocolate. I brought it from Switzerland. And he, whoa, this is Swiss chocolate. And then he brought us some, you know, stuff from, from his garden. We still didn't have a garden in that time. Anyway, good neighbors. Across the street, a guy, he talks a lot, even more than me. That guy can kill you talking. How He talks. I mean, he can talk your ears off. But, and only politics. He's in fire for politics. But that man is a good man. 
and he would come and say, neighbor, I noticed that your gun and your grass is too big, and that's what I do. I mow. Let me help. I said, let me pay you. No, 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 I'm, you are a new neighbor. I'm gonna. Good people. The neighbor across the street in the left, not these two in the right, but in the left, an old man, his wife died of cancer. His daughter has cancer. Good man, he would come and... Uh, I can watch your dogs and your plants when you go and good neighbor. However, the neighbor in the left next to us, heaven, I've never seen anything like that in my life. I mean, evil is nothing. Bad. When you say evil, I mean, sometimes I thought that Satan can learn from them how to be evil. You know? Bad. He would get on the deck and curse with, I cannot even tell you the first letter of the word. Blank, 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 immigrants. We, blank, 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 hate you. Go to your country. What are you doing here? And they would curse and use terrible, dirty, bad language and scream. And how long can you take that? If you are me, how long can you take that? From morning to night, every day, cursing and screaming and bad people. One time they called the police on us. The police came. They say that they cannot sleep. Your dogs are barking. I said, come over. I called the police behind the house. And I said, do you hear dogs barking? Yes. Do you see my dogs? Yes. What do they do? Sleeping. They don't bark? No. Then it's not my dogs. It's the other neighbor, the farmer's dogs. Oh, yeah, we can hear that. It was the other neighbor. He has a dog. Man, that dog barks worse than a chihuahua. I mean, all the time. He's like, he never stops. And so I said, it's not my dogs. The police said, okay, okay, sorry. And they left. Next day, the Humane Society came. Your neighbor called us that you abuse animals. I said, my animals live better than people. They are spoiled to death. Gucci sleeps on my pillow around my head. They eat better than I do. I mean, they get the best food. They get organic and they get treats and they get sweet potatoes and they get this and they get that and they get organic eggs and they might. And they say, we need to check. They go and they check the dogs. Whoa, that's an Amish dog house. That's expensive and you have heat in it. And they, oh, the food is like, man, your dogs have a good life. We wish every dog. I said, okay, God bless you. You know, they left. Those neighbors made our life miserable. Day in, day out, from morning to night, they hated us to the core. I don't know why. After two years, I got so tired. I told my wife, I'm even afraid to get outside on the deck because they curse. I think we need to move. And sometimes those people call themselves Christians. You understand? Just because they go to church and they sing kumbaya, they think they are Christians. But if you want to know how much you love God, measure how much you love your neighbor. And then you know how much you love God. Hello? Even those that hate you, to the degree that you love those that hate you, to that degree you actually love God. You, you heard me? Because you are quiet. You don't like it. I will pray for you. Okay. And so, this is what happened. I said to my wife, we need to move. And my wife says, you need to get out of ministry. I said, why? Because you don't live what you preach. I said, I do. No, you don't. You just said last Sabbath that we need to love even those who hate you. Do you love your neighbors? I said, but those are unlovable. <laughs> she said, no, 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 no. Jesus loves them. I said, I know, and that's enough. If God loves them, I don't have to. And she says, no, you need to love them. I said, it's impossible. She says, then you need to get out of ministry. You need to repent. You have a problem. Man, I didn't like my wife anymore, at least for a moment. And then I said, listen, honey, how do you love those people? And she says, you start praying for them, and you say, Lord, please save them. And then you do what Jesus did. I said, okay, tell me again. Probably you know better. What did Jesus do? And she says, you not only pray for them, but you are willing to die for them. Hello? I said, that's too far. And she says, this is the way you pray. Lord, now I want you to listen carefully. Please do whatever it takes. Even take my life you, if you could save them. And you say, Lord, I am willing to lay my life down. Because that's what Jesus did. He died for his enemies. So please, if that's what it takes to save my neighbors, I am happy to die if they could be in heaven. 
I said, honey, I'm sorry. I cannot pray that. I said, then get out of ministry. Mm. I stopped. I thought about it. I said, Lord, forgive me. I am not like Jesus. And I got on my knees. I said, Lord, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my neighbor. Not, you follow me? But it's me, O oh Lord, that I need repentance. And every time we point to somebody else, it's you. Hello? So I said, it's me, O oh Lord. And I said the most difficult words. It was like pulling teeth. I hate dentists, you know. I just, when you go to the dentist, it's the longest time that it goes. One hour, it becomes like a prophetic one hour. Like so many hours that you stay on that seat. I cannot stand it. And so I, it was pulling teeth. I said, Lord, I'm not sure if I'm willing to do that, but I'm going to say it. Please, if that's what it takes, take my life and save them. After two years of no peace in my heart, literally no peace, first time in two years I had peace. It didn't solve the problem with the neighbors right away, but I had peace, instant peace. When I said those words, Lord, I'm willing to die for them, it somehow, I cannot explain it, didn't bother me that they would curse. I just, I was like no emotions, like crocodile skin, thick. No emotions. And so I got on the deck. I went to the garden. And he started, you, ta ta ta, immigrants, you, da da da. I waved. I said, good to see you too. <laughs> went to the garden. His son put a drone, and his drone came above my property, above my head. I felt like taking the gun and shooting the drone, but I said, no, we are Christians. You know? And so I prayed. After that, every day, Lord, save my neighbors. When I started to pray that way, being willing, or at least trying to be willing, to lay my life down for them, five days later, it happened. I was in the house. And by the way, I forgot to tell you, when we moved there two years before, we started to plant a garden. And I noticed his wife trying to plant a garden. And we lived on the mountain, on the mountain. Rock, solid bed, I mean bedrock, rock. She tried and she tried and she tried and she tried. Every single plant died. Not one plant, not even one tomato, nothing. We had to put cinder blocks and put 10, 15 trailers of compost in order to plant because it was solid rock. And we did have a big garden. When I say big, Canaan garden, you know, the Garden of Eden. Eden, you know, garden with no exaggeration. I have pictures, uh, two point something tomatoes, 2.8 pounds tomatoes, 4 point something pounds eggplants, peppers like that. Literally, I have pictures bigger than my palm. Watermelon, four feet long watermelon. Can you imagine? Big garden, gigantic produce. And so back to the story. I hear something outside. When I look outside, the neighbor's two dogs playing with my dogs. They escaped and came on our property. If my dogs would have gone on his property, he would have called the police, you know. But anyway, so I go down and I take treats and I go down to them, come on, puppy, come on, come on, come on. And I pet them and I give them a hug and I play with them and I scratch them behind the ears where they like and I give them treats and the dogs put their head on me and, oh, I love animals. And, if you don't love animals, you'll not be happy in heaven. There will be a lot of them, you know. And so, I love animals and I give them a hug. I cannot even understand people who abuse animals. It's like Balaam beating the donkey. The donkey had no fault. Balaam was the problem. Always they beat somebody else for their own fault, you know, crazy. Anyway, and so, I was playing with the dogs. And the neighbor comes out looking for the dogs. And he sees me and he freezes like in movies. Like, breathe. You are going to die. And he sees me and he, uh, 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 he doesn't know what to say. I say, good morning. I said, I'm going to bring them back if you want. Uh, uh-huh. He said, okay. I take, come on, puppy, let's go home, let's go home. I take the dogs on his property and he says, are you going to call the police on me? I said, no. And I said, come on over. Why? Did they do any damage you want me to pay? I said, no, they are good. They are sweet dogs. Come on over. Do you want me to clean the poop? Did they poop on your property? I said, no, come on over. Why? I said, just come for a second. Uh-uh. 
<laughs> I said, come on, man. Uh, okay. He was following me. I took him to the garden. I gave him a basket. I said, help yourself. He goes, these are big tomatoes. What did you do? What did you spray them with? I said, nothing. Just compost. He took two tomatoes, one cucumber, and he left. I said, no, 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 come on back. And I put tomatoes, and I put okra, and I put peppers, and I put zucchini, and I put, you know, cucumbers, and I gave him two cantaloupes and the watermelon. He could not even carry The basket was full. He had his hand with the cantaloupe, and, like, and he says, can I call my wife? I said, it's your wife. You decide if you call her. Do you ask me permission to call your wife? You know? He leaves it down. He calls his wife. Honey, come over. She says, where? The neighbors. What neighbors? You know. And she screams in the telephone, the immigrants? And he says, uh-huh. Is it safe? <laughs> he, says, he says, come. Can I take the kids? Man, two kids, the boy tall in the uh, army, in the military academy, you know, big guy. She says, can I take the kids with me for safety? He says, no need. Oh, I'm going to take the kids anyway. Okay. The wife comes over. And he shows her the basket. He says, you need to see the garden. This is unbelievable. This is like, like gigantic. If you see the tomatoes, they are like, and you're like the head, they are big. And I mean, you hold the tomato on two palms if you see the pictures. And 10 feet tall tomatoes with 50, 60 tomatoes per plant. 30, 32, 35 peppers per plant. Gigantic. I have pictures because it sounds exaggerated. But people, when they see it, oh, it's better than what you said. Anyone. So she comes over and she, oh, what a garden. And I give her a basket. She says, no, what he has you? No, help yourself. They go to waste. I have too much. I give to the neighbors. I give people to work. We can and still we have too much. We freeze. Please take. She takes and I put more. I fill her basket. And she puts the basket down. And she says, why would you do that? You know that we hate you. And I said, no, you don't hate me. You just don't know me. And you are afraid. New neighbor, you know, you don't hate me. She says, uh, yeah, we did hate you. I said, that's okay. Let's forget it. Let's move on. I says, why do you do that? I said, well, that's what neighbors are supposed to do. We want to have a good relationship as neighbors. And she breaks. And she starts crying. Tears just going. And she says, I am sick. I go to the doctor. I cannot sleep for several years. I take a hand of pills and still cannot sleep. As soon as there is a noise, I get stomach pain. I start shaking. I cannot sleep. And she says, dogs bother me. I said, listen, it was not my dogs. But if it ever, if it's my dogs or me, you just call us. This is the telephone number. And I promise I will take care of it. I want you to be happy. And I said, I will pray for you. Can I pray for you? She says, please. So I prayed for her health. I prayed for her husband. I prayed for their job, for their family, for their children. And she was crying. She says, thank you. I says, for nothing. We are supposed to pray for one another, aren't we? And she is looking and she starts telling us, me too, and my wife, her life. And for 45 minutes, 50 minutes, she talks. And she, like, we are friends forever. We knew each other forever. There was never a conflict there. She just talks like to the best friend. She opens. And after 45 minutes, I say, listen, we need to do this again. You come over, and we pray again, and we get vegetables. I'm going to cook Romanian food. I know how to cook. And we'll eat. Oh, would you? You cook Romanian food? We come. And instantly, all the tension gone. How many times do we do that? We just assume the other one is wrong, is bad, and we are good. But Christians are supposed to be like Christ. And when you want to prepare for the second coming, it is good that you go to church. It is good that you keep Sabbath. It is good that you pray and you read the Bible. But all those can become routine forms if you don't let God transform your heart and be like Jesus. And our life preaches better than our sermons. Hello, did you hear me? Is the best possible sermon. And the real preparation is when we allow God to fill us with his presence to the degree that we no longer control our life, but God is in control. And people can see Jesus literally, not you, not me, Jesus living in us. That's when we represent God properly. 
Otherwise, we misrepresent God before the world. We falsely carry the name Christians because we do God a, a, a disfavor, or however you say in English. We don't help. We do damage to God's name. Christians are supposed to be Christ on earth. That's the reason we are the body of Christ. He is the head. He is not here. But we are here to show Christ to a society that doesn't know God. To a self-centered society. A hateful society. We are supposed to show them love and compassion. This is not my subject today. This is the introduction to the title. Not even the title. But again, we are called to show God's love to a world that is desperate for love. They don't even know what love means, moreover, to show love. We are called to show that love works. How are we going to feel good in heaven, or even go to heaven, if we don't understand love? Do you hear me? And God is calling you and me to allow His Spirit to transform Form us to the degree that people see Jesus, that Jesus lives in us, to the degree that we learn how to love and we learn how to walk with him and how to talk with him and how to obey him and trust in him. To be ready for the second coming means that you no longer live, you die to self, but Jesus lives in you. As long as you are alive, you will never live. You need to die, and only those that die with Christ, they will be resurrected to Christ and live with Christ. Unless a grain would go in the ground and die, it will never produce any fruit. Paul says, I die daily. It's easy to keep Sabbath. It's even easy to return tight. But it's difficult to die to self. I would rather kill everybody around me than die to self. You, you know what I'm saying? That's the acidity test of Christianity. Are you willing to die to self? If Christ, God, died for you, shouldn't you also die? That's what Paul says. I die daily. I've been crucified. I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. That means that you have no say. If you get upset, if you argue, it means that you live. If Christ lives in you, you don't say what you want. Jesus says, I don't even speak my own words. I speak the words that the Father gives me. And then in John 5, he says, I don't do my own works. I don't speak, I don't do. I do the works that the, I see the Father doing. Basically, God is in control. That means that you surrender. Not only sing, all to Jesus I surrender, and you don't mean it. You literally surrender daily. There is no victory. There is no growth. There is no blessing there is no peace, there is no joy, there is no salvation before you learn to surrender. And when you surrender, you think that you are going to lose everything. But you, before you surrender, you keep losing. Only when you surrender, finally, you learn that that's when you get victory. And that's when God can go ahead of you and fight for you. And if God fights for you, you don't need to fight. He does a better job. And we are afraid to trust ourselves in God's hands. We trust self more than we trust God. And we forget that he died on the cross. God, the Holy One, came and he gave up the kingdom. And he was beaten and, and, and flagged. And he was uh, basically mocked and spit. And he died. God died for you. And we still don't trust him. And only when you, we say, by the bullet, take the step in, in faith and surrender, you think that you lose everything. And then you realize you actually didn't lose. In fact, that's when you really have a blessing. Be like Abraham, I'm going to lose my son. And God said, no, when you surrender, actually I'm not going to take my son. But from now on I can bless your son. How do you surrender? How do you grow? How can you be filled with God's presence? Jesus says, now finally we start the sermon. Jesus says, it's better for you if I go. Why could it be better for me if you go, Jesus? Because the spirit of prophecy says that Jesus could have been only in one place with them in human body. But the Holy Spirit can be with everybody in the same time everywhere. And so Jesus says, it's better for you if I go. Because if I go, I will send you the comforter. And he, he, he is going to lead you in how many things? How much means all? 
95%? 99%? I looked in the grammar in Greek and I translated the word. You know how you translate the word all? Very simple, all. <laughs> I'm going to be with you in all. All means all. Doesn't matter work or home or, or job or school or whatever you do. I'm going to be with you in all. Spiritual things, physical, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you in all things. You cannot do it. But with me, you can do it. Nothing is impossible for God. I'm going to be with you. Jesus says in John 15, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Separated from me, you can do nothing. Nada, zero, nothing. But if you are in me and I in you, if you abide in me, you can do, you can produce much fruit. That's how you know people. Jesus says you'll know them by their fruit. That's how you know people. You see that they produce fruit, you know that Jesus lives in them. The Holy Spirit. If you see no fruit, it means it's only tak, 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 but no walk. You follow me? And so, I'm going to send you the comforter. I'm going to send you the comforter. I'm going to send you the comforter. Think about that. I was in a, in, in long ago, like 200 years ago when I was young, I was in a church <laughs> 200 years ago. I was in construction university. I was a student, and I, uh, uh, I was, I don't even know how old I was, right after the military service. But anyway, I was young, very young, probably around 20, I don't know. And, and I was in a church, big church, big church. I mean, big, I don't know, 1,000 members, 2,000. I, I don't want to exaggerate. It doesn't matter the number. I was in a big church. And there were a few big churches in Bucharest. I don't know, four, five, six. Many small, but a few, a few big churches. And this church had the best musical programs that you could ever hear. I mean, it was like you listen to King Heralds or Heritage Singers or whatever. I mean, it was good musical programs but nothing else. They are good people. I mean, we met every Sunday in the park and played soccer, and we had good food, good game, everybody was happy. But nothing else. There was no spiritual growth, there was no Bible studies, there was no evangelism, there was no uh, baptisms, there was no activities, no mission trips, no visiting the elderly, no helping the poor, no helping the sick. Zero. You would go to church, listen to the sermon, go back home, and you will know something is missing. No power. The pastor was old, dying on the pulpit. I don't know, 95 years old, 105, I don't know, 89. He was like, uh, leaning on the pulpit. Uh, brothers, uh. he's like, oh, come on, he's going to die. And so nothing happening. We didn't have pastors because the communist government didn't allow us to have too many students in the seminary. So we had to keep the old pastors until they would die. And so it was boring. Elderly or regular adults in the church were <laughs> sleeping. It's so Sabbath, day for rest, you know, you cannot judge. And then the youth at the balcony, over 60 young people at the balcony, talking, telling jokes, looking to the magazine, looking to the, you know, cars, like, whoa, this is a Maserati, whoa, look to this Ferrari, Lamborghini. Young people didn't care about church because it was boring, you know. And so what do you do when you go to that type of church? What do you do? Nothing happening, dead, and no power. You know, you go to the church and you feel something is missing. There is no power, there is no transformation, there is no spiritual life, there is no food. What do you do? Well, you have two, three options. One option is to do nothing. The other option is to judge. Oh, this pastor is terrible. The, com the committee and, and uh, the conference and, to judge. Well, the Bible says that you should not judge. If you judge, you will be judged. To the measure you judge, to that measure you will be judged. Judgment is God's job. Your job is to love and to serve, to help. God's job is judgment, and he doesn't need your help. He does it pretty good. And so, what do you do? First option is to do nothing. Second option is to judge, criticize, gossip. But third option is actually to do something about it and be part of the solution. So I decided, I called my father, I said, what do you do in this situation? And my father said, you pray. I said, but you need to do something else. I said, he said, no. If you go ahead of God, you'll never have success. You pray until God gives you the solution. And then when God gives you the solution, then he gives you success. So I said, okay. So I called my best friend. We did all the stupid stuff together. And I called him. I said, hey, man, let's pray. For what? For the church. Uh, he started to laugh. He was also in construction university with me one year uh, ahead of me. He said, okay. We met in his attic. He was renting from somebody an attic. It was Terrible hot, no AC. It was summer, like 44 Celsius, and he was in the attic. Can you believe he was like in an oven, cooking himself, you know? 
And, and so he says, let me meet here in the attic. I said, there in swim institute or what? He says, let me hear and pray. We met there and we prayed half an hour every evening. And we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed one day, a week, two weeks. And then I said to my father, should I invite everybody, the whole youth of the church? My father said, no. Unless they are committed to prayer, it's not going to work. It's going to get the others discouraged. And he said, just take two or three. Jesus doesn't say 200 or 300. Jesus says, whatever, two or three. And this is a promise. God cannot lie because of his character. If he says, whenever two or three of you get together, there is something in the world together, the togetherness, the togetherness. When people, whenever two or three pray together, and then he says in one accord, not referring to Honda Accord, he says in one accord, that means unity of purpose. They unite and they have one goal. They get together and they pray with purpose, one accord. All of them, we are going to pray for this until we get it. Lord, I'm not going to let you live before you bless me. You can kill me, you can do whatever, Lord, but I am not going to move from here before you answer. God loves those prayers. When he sees his people uniting with one purpose, he loves. Because that prayer brings not only an answer, but brings unity in the church and commitment. And so, my father said to me, two, three, committed to prayer and you pray together for one purpose, for revival. I said, how does it happen? He says, well, you pray for the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, power comes. They come together. And revival comes. Pray for revival for that church. He says, that's the greatest need that we have. I said, okay. Didn't really get it, but I did what he said. I trusted him. And so I told my friend, we are going to pray for the Holy Spirit for revival for this church, that God will revive the church. And then one of the young people, the girl that played the piano, very good girl, she came, hey man, I noticed that you meet every evening. Said, yeah, what do you do? You watch movies? No. What do you do? We pray. Uh, really? I said, yeah. Is it fun? I said, yeah. Can I come? No. If you say come, you know, they don't come. If you say no, you cannot come. They, oh, come on, please. Young people always want to have what they cannot, cannot have. I said, no, you cannot come. Come on. I said, no. Come on. Okay. You know. <laughs> she came. And then about two weeks later, a young guy, I'm not going to say the name, very funny, very crazy, even crazier than I was. And he says, hey, man, I, got, I, I heard that you meet for prayer. What do you do there? We pray. Is it fun? I said, yep. How can it be fun? I said, I'm not going to tell you. Can I come? No. Please? No. Please? Okay. <laughs> then we were four praying. And then we were five. And then we were 11. And then we made rules. If you come, you cannot miss it. And you have to pray. If you miss it, you are going to be fined 50 bucks. Why? I said, because you missed it. You know? <laughs> Very simple. What do you do with the money? We put it in the youth fund for the mission trip next, ti next time. Oh, okay. You know? They could not miss it because they would be fined, you know. <laughs> And we had 11, and we had 20, and eventually we had over 50 young people praying. Not in the attic, no more room. We met in the church in the basement every week. And we met like once, twice, I don't remember, a week. And we prayed together. After a few months, maybe four, five, six months, the church started to change. Even the fact that the young people were praying, the young people, instead of being crazy, they started to study not only to pray, they started to get involved, to visit the elderly, to visit and wash and clean and shop and cook and help the elderly, visit people in hospital, go in mission trips. They started to do Bible studies. The youth was transformed. The youth was involved. It was active. Different young people, you would see Jesus in them. You would see love. You would see them planning and working and praying and studying. It was different. The parents started to call me. What have you done? My kids wake up at 5 a.m. and pray. I've never seen them doing that. When the parents tell you, man, how did you do it? Because I was trying to convince them to pray and they will never do. And now they wake up at five. They love to sleep in. They wake up at five. Praise the Lord. You, you understand? And then they started to pray and the pastor got retired and the new pastor came and he was preaching. People would not move. People would be on the tip of the chair and like the dentist, not move. He was preaching profoundly and the church just transformed. And that was not us. It was the Holy Spirit. It was the new pastor. It was the youth praying. All of the above. But what do you do when your church is called? You judge. You do nothing. Or you pray for the church. You understand what I am trying to say? If it worked then, it works now. If it worked there, it works here. If the church is the way it is, it's not the church fault. It's your fault. 
That means that you don't care. Because if you care enough to commit yourself and sacrifice yourself and get down and say, Lord, I need you. If you pray, God loves that. No honest prayer we go without an answer, says in the spirit of prophecy. To every honest prayer, an answer will come. It may not come in the time we desire, the way we want, but God will answer in the best time, better than we think. And then later she says, if we knew the end from the beginning, we would choose the same path. Anyway, so we prayed, we prayed, we prayed. The disciples in the upper room, they prayed. That's how they say, says in the spirit of prophecy, turn the world upside down. They prayed. We know that prayer has power. We know that prayer connects us with the source of power, with God. And if we know that, why do we pray so little? Why do we try to do things in human power, in human wisdom, in human efforts, and fail again, and our life is miserable, and we just don't say, Lord, I need you. You follow me? Christians are supposed to be connected to Christ. And so, let me go to, this was the title. Let me go to the subject, finally. Let me go to the subject. Uh, I don't know when I'm supposed to finish. Probably, uh, I have another half an hour, I think. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. And so, let me go to the title. When Jesus left, he gave the disciples what we call the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? What is the Great Commission? You remember? Go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth and make disciples. Preach the gospel. What is the gospel? The good news. Go and tell the world so they have a chance. Tell them that Jesus died for them. Tell them that his grace is sufficient. Tell them that they can get forgiveness. Tell them that they can get help. Tell them that there is hope and they can be saved. Give them the good news so they have a chance. Tell them. And I... I, I I stay in awe and I think about that. It was absolutely impossible. What Jesus told them, it was absolutely 100% impossible. You think about 11 people. Take 11 from here. Maybe there are more, 120. It doesn't matter. You think about this group of people. And if I ask you to evangelize British Columbia, you say, are you crazy? We cannot even evangelize our city. <laughs> but if I ask you to evangelize Canada, isn't that a bigger task for you? But if I ask you to evangelize North America, but if I ask you to evangelize the whole world and communist countries and Muslim countries and Hindu countries and advanced Western secular countries, how can you do it? We as a whole church worldwide are getting behind every year because regardless how fast we grow, three point whatever percent, there are more people born than we baptize. So every day we are getting behind the target. You follow me? How can you, a small group, evangelize the world? That's impossible. And the Spirit of Prophecy says, the disciples knew that they cannot do it. They knew. Moreover, they had no money. They had no internet, no media. They were persecuted. They didn't have cars and trains and TV and internet and cell phone and Facebook. They didn't. And so they knew that they cannot do it. But they knew that they were promised the power of the Holy Spirit. They knew that. They knew that it's not by human might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. They knew that. So what they did, they got on their knees in the upper room, and they prayed day and night, day and night for 10 days. Lord, you promised to give us the comforter. Please, we cannot do it. We are weak. We depend on you. Lord, we cannot do it. Please send us the comforter. They prayed in one accord. Let me tell you, if you think that the Great Commission is go and preach, is it or no? You are wrong. Let me tell you what is the Great Commission. You have to read the... Because the Great Commission is go and preach, but is more than that. Jesus instructed the disciples about the most... What means most? Most essential, most complete gift that God could give to his people. And that gift, when that gift came, would bring boundless resources. What means boundless? Hello? 
Can we grasp the meaning? I mean, unlimited. Don't you want to have unlimited resources, unlimited power? Uh, anybody would like that. Hey, I would like to have unlimited resources. <laughs> unlimited, boundless resources. I will pray that the Father is going to send you the comforter. That's what we need in the church. If you want to do your job, if you want to be transformed, if you want to be saved, if you want to see your family saved, if you want to see the church growing, if you want to reach Canada, if you want to reach the world, you need boundless power. And that's when the Holy Spirit comes. They understood that. They understood that. The Spirit was given for a special purpose. Without the Spirit, the work could not have been accomplished. The preaching of the Word would be of no avail without the presence of the Spirit. And so, Jesus, before he told them, and this is what we need to understand, before he told them, go, go, go and tell, go and tell, he said, if you look carefully at the last chapter of the book of Acts and first chapter of Luke, if you look carefully, I'm, I'm sorry, the other way around, last chapter of Luke and first chapter of Acts, I got it wrong. Okay, if you look carefully, Jesus said, and that was a command, it was, in Greek, is not a suggestion. It's an imperative in grammar. He says, do not go. Don't you attempt to do God's work in human power and methods. And then I says, the reason for our lack of success, the reason for our failure, is that we trust too much human methods, strategies, programs, and too little the power of God. We pray, Lord, help me, and then we go and do it instead of waiting upon the Lord. Those who wait upon the Lord renew their strength. And so Jesus said, do not go. But wait in the city, Jesus said, and pray. You remember those Bible verses? Do not go. But wait and pray. How many times do we do that in our meetings? We plan and go instead of pray and wait. Wait and pray. How long should we pray, Jesus? How long? I mean, we have a good program. We started in January. Ten days of prayer. Isn't that beautiful, Jesus? Did Jesus say ten days? No. Okay, Jesus, we have a better program. 40 days of prayer. Is that good? Yes? No? Yes. Did Jesus say 40 days? You know what he said? Pray until. He said until. What does he mean until? Pray until. It's like the woman who went to the judge. It's like the man who said, I had visitors, and he knocks at 2 a.m. in the neighbor's window. I need a bread. I have visitors. Go away. Come tomorrow. It's 2 a.m. I am sleeping. Now, he opens the door. Come on, man, I'm going to let my dogs free. No, I don't care. Knocks in the window. Come on, man. Nope. Before you give me a bread, I don't. So you better give me a bread and then I go. Okay, take the bread and go. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Pray until. That means that if he doesn't answer, what do you do? Keep praying. Pray until. Until doesn't mean 40 days. That until means you keep praying. Until. You receive the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus says, I want you to listen. When the Holy Spirit comes, quote, you shall receive. That's what we miss in our lives. That's what we miss in our churches. We lack power. We go to church, we listen to the sermon, we go home, nothing happens. When the Holy Spirit came, the disciples prayed, and the Holy Spirit came. When the Holy Spirit came, boom, dynamite. I mean, they preach. And they speak in tongues. And people say, are you drunk? And Peter says, you see them all speaking in tongues? They are not drunk. They received the promise of the comforter. When the comforter came, boom, they speak in tongues. Not only that, but 5,000 get baptized. And before they had no baptism, zero. Not one. Not one. They, oh, we preach to the priest and to the Pharisee and the Sadducees. And uh, it's impossible. No, nothing. Is, Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful. 5,000 get baptized. I cannot imagine the church clerk calling everybody, hey, tell me your name, your address, your date of birth. Okay, next. Call, tell me your name, uh, date of birth. Next. <laughs> and after the whole night, I managed to call only 300 people and I have to call another 4,700. Uh, and then next day, 3,000 get baptized. The clerk is like, ooh, what am I going to do? And then the Bible doesn't even say how many because there are too many. The Bible says God added. Can you grasp the words God added daily? That means they had the baptism Monday. And they had the baptism Tuesday. They had the baptism Wednesday. Daily. Daily means daily. And they had the bap. And the Bible doesn't like Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And after two months, they say, man, we need to change the water in the baptismal tank. We have no time. We have another 5,000 people. Just put some bleach in it. <laughs> you understand? You get the picture. What if we had that in our church? 
At least a thousand. Okay, not five. Okay, at least 500 a day. Is that possible? Not in our power. But yes, the Holy Spirit can change the hearts. Then why do we keep trying, keep trying to do it in our power instead of, Lord, we need you. We desperately need you. We will never finish the work in our power. It's not by my, nor by power, but by my spirit. Why don't we say, Lord, please give us the latter rain. You promised, here we are waiting, please. It's, we just read the paragraph, if you remember, two paragraphs before. He said, is the greatest and most important, most essential gift that the church needs. If it's the most important, why do we pray for everything else and work for everything else, but not for the Holy Spirit? Satan wants us to be ignored, so we never experience power. But power comes when the Holy Spirit comes. Jesus says, pray until you receive the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power. They come together. When God comes, power comes. If we don't have power, that means, what does it mean? The Holy Spirit may be working with us, but we have never received the fullness of the latter rain. You follow me? Okay. You will receive power. Then go. Well, let me tell you something very interesting. Very interesting. I'm going to tell you why we don't have that desire to pray for the Holy Spirit. We don't have that desire to, de to receive power. Let me tell you why. When the women went to the grave and they had those spices for Jesus' body, you know, like a balsamic stuff that they, you put on the body and it smells good. And Moreover, in Palestine, where it was extremely hot, when I was there, it was like 50, 60 Celsius. It was like crazy hot. And so they had those, I don't know how to call it, herbs or whatever, and oils and whatever, I don't know. And the women came to the grave. And Jesus is not there. And somebody talks to them, you remember, an angel, and says, he is not here. He has been resurrected. Now, it's easy for you because you know the story. But they didn't know the story. And if you would go to a grave right here at the cemetery, and somebody says, oh, he's not here. He was resurrected. Would you believe it? Huh? Uh-uh. Well, I saw him dead, but he was resurrected. How? Uh, uh. And the angel says, oh, he was resurrected. And I say, what? And, and what does the angel say? Go and tell the disciples that he was... Does the angel say that? Go and tell everybody, preach the good news? No. The angel says, come and see. And only then go and tell. The reason we don't tell anybody is because we ourselves have not seen it yet. Jesus says, you are my witnesses. You cannot be a witness in the court of law if somebody told somebody who told somebody who told you. You need to have seen it in order to be a witness. You follow me? That's what John says. What we have seen, that's what we tell you. Let me give you an example. When we moved from Romania 25, 26 years ago to America, when we moved, we had nothing. Nothing. We came with $140 in my pocket. I had nothing, you know. And so we moved. I went to school in Southern Adventist Uni University in Tennessee, in college there. I went to school. We didn't have a driver license. We didn't have insurance. We didn't have a work permit. We didn't have a credit card. After one year, I finished school, and I was supposed to, I took my bachelor in, in one year, finished. <coughs> I was supposed to go to Andrews for my master's. And all, finally, we had a few clothing and a bunch of books, a bunch of books. You know, you have kids, you have clothing, you have books, you, you're all in school. So we put everything in boxes. And the school told us after the summer classes, the new students are coming in a week, so you need to get out. Where do we go? We have no place to go. We called Andrews. Do you have an apartment for us? They said, uh, it takes six months. It's a waiting list of six months to get an apartment. We need to come next week. We cannot wait six months. We don't have six months. We put you on the list. Six months, sometimes longer. What do we do? We prayed and prayed, and we didn't know where to move. So a friend of us, a retired counselor, school counselor, called and a friend of us, and he said, come over for a week until you go to Andrews. They kicked you out of the apartment. You can live with me and put your stuff in my garage. So we moved there, and then we started to pray for a way to move to Andrews. Well, there was a truck driver 
that was driving for Florida conference. And he called Mr. Ralph, our friend, and said, Ralph, I'm driving to Andrews. I'm driving two pastors that move from Florida conference to Andrews. They go to school to get their masters. And I have my truck, it's going to be full. I go to first pastor, he's going to load half of the truck. And then I go to second pastor, he's going to load the other half. And then I drive from Florida to Michigan. And I'm going to drive by your place. Because your grandma gave me a little piece of furniture to drop for you. And I said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. By the way, do you have a little room? There is a Romanian family, they don't have much stuff. And they cannot afford to rent a truck. Can you move them too? He says, I would love to, but these pastors, they have a lot of stuff. I have no room. After they load, I have no room. I'm sorry, I cannot. Seven, eight hours later, the truck driver stopped on Mr. Ralph's gate. I mean, driveway. There is no gate. And he stopped there. <clears throat> and it was raining. Heavy, heavy, heavy. I mean, like under the fire hose. Pouring, heavy, shh, rain. And he stops and he is covered and he takes the little piece of furniture. He runs to Mr. Ralph, gives him, okay, I'm gone. He says, what do you do about these kids from Romania? He says, oh, by the way, one pastor loaded the stuff and the other pastor said, I changed my mind. I don't go to Andrews this year. I go next year. So half of my truck is empty. I said, praise the Lord. We are going to move. And he says, no, because it rains. And if you get your stuff and your furniture and your books from the garage that is far away to the driveway that is far away, you are going to ruin everything. Everything is going to get wet. I said, we, we wait until the rain stops. He looks on the, his cell phone to the weather channel. And he says, five hours, 100% rain. I cannot wait five hours. I have to be in Andrews tomorrow morning. Bye. My wife and I kneeled down in the street on the asphalt next to the truck. We physically knelt down in the street and we said, Lord, please, if you want us to move, stop the rain. In that instant, the rain stopped. Now, there are three neighbors, Mr. Clark, an old, short, retired pastor, right across the street, and that was a narrow street, right across, the garage door opened, he was in the garage looking, watching, and he screamed, Pavel, don't you take your books in the rain, you are going to lose everything. And then it was, uh, Mrs. Andrews, that's her name, but she's not Andrews University, you know. She was teaching some, I believe, English, I don't remember. And then I had three neighbors watching, plus Mr. Ralph, where we were living. We kneeled on the street, we prayed, the rain stopped. We started to load, about 40 minutes, 50 minutes, I don't know, one hour later, we finished loading. And the truck driver goes to the back of the truck, and he closes the big doors, and in the moment, in the second, in, in the split of a second, in, in, in the fraction of the second, when he closed the door, shh, it started to rain. Not earlier, no later. In the moment he closed, shh, so he had no time to get from the back of the truck to the driver door. He got wet. And the neighbor like, wow! And this is where I am going. Mr. Clark, old, short, retired, old pastor, retired pastor. I've never seen anything like that. He started to literally jump. Wow, wow, wow. And he was like, are you okay, I said. He was, ah, 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 I cannot believe it. I, I've never seen anything like that in my life. I saw it with my eyes. You guys prayed and the rain stopped. And then you finished and the rain started. It was like the angels were holding the clouds. I've never seen in my life. I do go to church. I do keep Sabbath. I've never seen anything like this. This is amazing. Ah, man. He was going on and on. He could not help himself. And then we watched him. The driver left with our stuff. The driver asked me, do you have an apartment or do I drop your furniture? I said, no. And the driver says, what do I do with your furniture? I said, I don't know. And the guy says, I need to drop it somewhere. I said, I don't know. I am praying. He says, you better pray to the same God that stopped the rain and started the rain because I don't know what to do with your furniture. We prayed the whole night. In the morning, we got a telephone from Andrews that said one of the students got an emergency call from Africa, and he left, so we have an apartment. I said, you have it now? We have to clean it. Don't clean it. I called the driver. He says, I am 15 minutes away from Andrews. I said, this is the apartment. How did you get it? I said, well, long story. Just drop the furniture there. We got the apartment. But Mr. Clark, whoa, I've never seen anything like that. Whoa. And guess what he did? Next day in the morning, we finished calling Andrews, calling the driver. And then we see Mr. Clark going from door to door. I said, what do you do? 
I got to tell everybody. What? What? He said, what I've seen? I cannot, I cannot believe the rain stopped. I, I cannot help. I got to tell everybody. This is the greatest thing I've seen in my life. He could not help himself. He went from neighbor to neighbor telling the story. You know why he was so excited? Because he saw it. It's not what somebody told him. He witnessed it. The reason we have no excitement and no desire to tell or to do or to go is because we talk a lot about God, but we have not seen God in action. Because when you see God, you cannot help yourself. Isaiah, when he saw God, he was instantly transformed. Paul, a persecutor on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus. When he saw God, you, he turned all around. He became a different man. Simeon saw God. Zacchaeus saw God. The woman at the well. Mary. All of them, when they see God, they cannot help themselves. So many times we have the theory without the experience. Because when you see God, you then go and tell. You cannot help yourself. That's what the angel said to the women. Don't you try and go and tell. There is nothing to tell. You cannot give others hope unless you have hope. If you are discouraged, how can you give people hope? You cannot tell others to know Jesus if you don't know Jesus. You cannot tell others to pray if you don't pray. You cannot tell others to experience Jesus if you have not experienced Jesus. You need to repent in order to tell others to repent. You need to walk with me to tell others. You need to have power in order to tell others. You need to see it. You cannot give what you don't have. And that's what the angel says. You need first to see it, and then you can tell it. By the way, when Jesus says, you are my witnesses, the word in Greek is martus. Martus in translation doesn't mean witness. means martyr. That's where you have the martyr word from. You, Jesus doesn't say, you are my witnesses. Jesus says, you are my martyrs. Did you hear it? Well, let me tell you why. The spirit of prophecy says, and I will show you the quotations. I do have the quotations. I will put them on the screen. The spirit of prophecy says that the disciples did see Jesus performing miracles, but many times they had doubts. They expected him to deliver them from the Roman Empire. and to the, the, You know, you know those stories. But they didn't really believe. Even to the last moment, they thought he would deliver himself from the cross. And he'll give them victory over the Romans and over the Pharisees. They hoped that. But when they see him dying, they lost any hope. All hopes were gone. We believed that he was about to save us. You remember those verses and those quotations? We believed, but the big but, but uh, they were discouraged. And she says that they went to the upper room, not to pray, but because they were afraid of the Pharisees. If they killed him, they will kill us too. And they started to pray. And then she says that the more they prayed, the more they started to understand. And I will talk about this a little later. But eventually she says they understood the cross. We think we understand the cross. We have no clue. Zero understanding. God died on the cross for you. The king of the universe, the most holy one, the righteous, the creator, that angels bow down and cover themselves. He took your sin and my sin. He was flagged, he was beaten, he was mocked, he was naked and crucified. His hands and, and legs were nailed. He died for your sin so you can live. When they understood that God died for you and for me, who am I that God would die for me? Who are you that God would die for you? And she says when they got it, they were so overwhelmed that they were ready to die for him. They, didn't, they knew that the preaching of the gospel is going to cost them their life, and they didn't care. They just went and boldly. Peter knew <clears throat> that he would get arrested. They said, you need to stop. If you preach again, we will kill you. Next day, guess where he is? Preaching. They knew, but they loved him so much that they didn't care. He died for me. I died for him too. In fact, when they wanted to kill Peter, he says, don't crucify me like him. I am not worthy. Put me upside down. You remember? They 
understood the cross, when they got the message that God died for them, they were joyfully ready to die for him. And then my question is this. Are you ready to sacrifice everything and die for Jesus? Because if you are not, it means that you have never understood what he has done for you. And not only the cross, but what he's about to do, to give you eternity, is better and bigger than our heads. Because eternity, how long is eternity? <laughs> you understand? It passes my brain. How long? I mean, one million, ten millions? I mean, after 20 millions, I am still young, and just I start to count, and I cannot count. And you understand what I'm trying to say? God is going to give me that. Hello, I'm going to have my house on the lake. <laughs> How can you pay that? How can you pay the cross? How can you pay the blood? How can you pay eternity? How can you pay forgiveness? How can you pay? And God has done that for you, and for you, and for you, and for me. When they got that, they were ready to die for him. They said, we don't care this life. We don't care if we live or die. He loves us, we love him. And we are ready to sacrifice everything. That's what we sing. All to Jesus. I surrender. All to him I freely give. We sing it, but we have a hard time to surrender even like this. We, oh, should I? Uh, you know, that means that we don't know Jesus. We have not seen the cross. We don't understand Calvary. We don't understand his love. Because that's the reason the angel said, come and see first. You need to see it. You need to experience it. You need to grasp it. At least a drop from the ocean. If you grasp a drop of God's love that is infinite, Paul says that is beyond any type of human. To understand the love of God that surpasses, Paul says, any understanding. How can you understand something that surpasses understanding? But at least a drop. She says that in eternity in heaven we will learn more and more and never fully. Angels cannot grasp God's love and wisdom. When you come, that's the, the reason the angel says, come and see. When you come and see the cross and you start to grasp a drop of that, you are overwhelmed, you are touched, you are transformed, you will never be the same. And the reason we don't experience transformation is because we have a theory of religion, we have not seen the cross yet. That's the reason Paul says, I want to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. When you see the cross, instantly, you are transformed. Everyone in the Bible, when they see Jesus and his sacrifice, they are transformed. And we will continue on that line. I'm going to tell you what she says about the three angels' message, specifically about the third. She says, when people will understand the cross, Jesus' righteousness, his love, his sacrifice, his Calvary, when they understand righteousness by faith as a gift, she says, that is going to change them. And that message, she says, is going to quote, illuminate the whole world. And the preaching of that message, she says, is going to be accompanied by the rich outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that message is going to close the work and we'll go home. When we understand the cross, Satan would love us to do anything else but focus on the cross. And so, going back, the disciples finally understood the cross. Finally. And then... The Spirit of Christ says that in short time, a hand of people, quote, turned the world upside down. You remember the quotation? They, a group of people, evangelized in 32 years. The whole known world. How? They just turned the world upside down. Because the Holy Spirit was going ahead of them, giving them power. And so then, let me say this. <clears throat> it's very interesting. It's very interesting that I'm going to go quick through the quotations so you don't have time. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried for the holy unction. They didn't ask for a blessing for themselves as we most of the time pray, Lord, bless me, help me, heal me, get me, give me, the, me, 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 me. They didn't ask for a blessing for themselves. But the burden of salvation of souls. They realized that the gospel needs to be carried to the whole world. And they cannot do it. So they claimed the power that Christ has promised, the Holy Spirit. In obedience to Christ's command, they didn't go. They waited in the Jerusalem and they prayed for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Do you see the paragraphs? 
through the Holy Spirit coming, they were supposed to receive marvelous power. What we missed. And their testimony was confirmed with signs and miracles and wonders. The sick were healed, the dead resurrected, the demons possessed, delivered. It was just amazing. <clears throat> After the descent of the Holy Spirit, they were so filled with love for those that Jesus died that their hearts were melted. They spoke of the power of the Holy Spirit. Thousands were converted. The Spirit did for them that what they could not accomplish for themselves in a lifetime. <clears throat> as they call the remembrance, the words, now I want you to watch carefully because this is the key. They remembered what? The words that Christ spoke to them. And they repeated those words to one another. They finally understood that no sacrifice is too great. Now, I'm going to uh, try to finish. But uh, I'm looking to see, I have four more slides before I finish. I'll try to do it quick. It's better to ask forgiveness than permission. I want you to think about this Bible verse. Like an appeal, like a call to you that God addresses you. It says there, the eyes of the Lord range through the earth, north and south, east and west, back and forth, looking, scanning, through the earth, scanning through his church, looking to everyone. And God is looking for what? For somebody who is fully committed. And yet God cannot find. The Bible says, give me one. Give me one. And I can save the whole land. Give me one. Give me a Moses. Give me an Isaiah. Give me a, a Elijah. Give me a Joseph. Give me a Daniel. Give me one. God can do through one what he can do through a million. If that person is fully committed, ready to die for Jesus. And yet, we say we love Jesus, but we have hard time to fully commit. The reason God cannot finish the work is not because God is old and has arthritis. It's because we, his people, limit God's power. Because we say we love Jesus, yet we love self. There is no limit. You know what that means? No limit? The usefulness of one who put himself aside, sacrificing himself, makes room for the work of the Holy Spirit. There is no limit to the one that consecrates self to God, sacrificing self, dying to self, allows the Holy Spirit. God can do anything through that person. How are we going to go to heaven if we have hard time to die for Jesus? Paul says, I consider all things, all means all, job, Bank account, house, life, all things. All things, a loss for the price of knowing Jesus Christ. And I want to know not only him, but his sacrifice and his death. I want to be one with his sacrifice and be one with his resurrection. I want to be one with him. Listen, I want you to, to follow this sequence. Very important. The disciples. Number one. Very important. Humble themselves. They recognize, says in the spiritual prophecy, that they could not do the work and they need help. So they bow down in humble and say, Lord, we depend on you. Please. They recognize their dependence. Number two, they repented. When the slides were changed, they are not in the order. Should be repented, next line united, next line prayed. Should not be one line. They repented. They asked forgiveness. Lord, forgive me because I've been selfish. Forgive me because I was judging my neighbor. Forgive me because I think only about... Forgive me because I am talking what I should not. Forgive me for this. They asked forgiveness to God and to one another. They then united. They were one, helping one another, loving one another, loving the neighbor, loving the enemy. And then, so number one, humble. Number two, repented. Number three, United, number four, praise. You remember the Bible verse that says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, would turn around from their wicked ways, what, does, what, what is that, turning around? Repentance. And would pray, I would heal the land and answer their prayer. Why don't we get healing and answers? They humbled themselves. They repented, turned around. They united as one. What Jesus said, whenever two or three unite, in one, pray in one accord. United in prayer. And they prayed, number four, they prayed for the promise of the comforter. They prayed. God said, Jesus said, if you who are evil give good gifts to your children, how much more your Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who? 
ask. They ask for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And then, number five, I want you to re realize what I just read in the paragraph before. They repeated Jesus' teachings and the prophecies. They repeated. And as they repeated, it says that the Holy Spirit came and illuminated their mind. So they finally started to connect. Oh, he's the one in the prophecy, the Lamb. He's the one, the Messiah. He's a God. He was not. He's God. They started to understand that all those symbols from the sanctuary, it was about Jesus. And they started to understand that God actually was among them. God walked with them. God ate with them. God died for them. And they were so overwhelmed when they understood the cross that they were ready to sacrifice everything, including life, and joyfully die for Jesus. Did you follow the steps? What did they do? Number one, say it loud. Humble themselves. Number two, repented. Number three, Became one. Jesus says, if you are one, then the world will know that you are my people. As the Father and I are one, so you should. Division come from Satan. Unity come from Christ. Number four, they prayed for the Holy Spirit. Number five, repeated Jesus' teachings and the prophecies. Pray and study. Pray and study. Okay. Number six, the Holy Spirit illuminated their minds and they understood the cross. They understood the Calvary. They started to grasp that God died for them. They understood the cross. And number seven, as soon as they understood the cross, they went preaching, ready to die, joyfully to die. These are the points that if you follow later in 1844, Elena says that that's exactly the steps that the pioneers went through. We'll see, we'll get there. I want you to uh, understand, we'll finish now. I have literally... Uh, two or three more slides. He speaks to each child of humanity. It is for thee that the Son of God carries the burden of guilt. For thee, he dies. For thee, for thee, if you keep reading, for thee, he offers himself upon the cross as a sacrifice out of love for you. He, the sin bearer, endures the wrath of divine justice. And for you, he becomes sin. If you understand that, have you so deep an appreciation of the sacrifice that you will be willing to make every other interest subordinate to the work of saving souls? The same intensity, the same desire to save sinners that marked Jesus should mark the life of every follower. The Christian should have no desire to live for self. The Christian should delight in consecrating all to the master's service. The Christian would be moved by an inexpressible desire to win souls. Those that don't have that desire should be concerned for their own salvation. We finished. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, <clears throat> let me say this. Uh, very interesting when I uh, I'm trying to see if I have time to give the probably I don't have time it's only four minutes left over uh, I had a story that e exemplifies very well what I said um, so I'm going to give it quick there was a lady Fen Shuyen in China difficult name to say and this lady Fen Shuyen, this lady, an Adventist, going to church, singing kumbaya, eating tofu, returning tithe, going to camp meeting, all the, all the above, all the good stuff. This lady, one day, got this paragraph that I just read. It is for thee that the king of heaven died. And I don't know the details, and I'm not going to go through the details because I don't know all of them. But she started to understand the cross. And she was so touched, so impressed that God, the God of the universe, the Holy One, would die for her. Who is she? That God would come down and die for her. And so she decided to sacrifice all. And she thought, I will lose all, but I don't care. He lost everything for me. This life is short. Very soon Jesus comes. Everything is going to burn. I don't care if I lose everything for him. So she started to pray for the Holy Spirit that God would give her power and wisdom how to reach the neighbors. And she started to 
the way you show that you love Jesus, you love your neighbor. She started to pray for the neighbors. And then she started to go to them and give them a bread and a book and offer a prayer. Can I pray for you? And then she would go to the next one, a bread, a book. Can I pray for you? And she would go from neighbor and then second time and then third time. And then she said, come over. I want us to pray for one another. And she invited a neighbor and then two neighbors and then three neighbors. And then soon enough, she had every day in her garage 70, 80 people that sh they were praying for one another. No, not that. It's between the neighbors. And then it grew to 150 people that got converted, baptized. And she said, my garage, first they met in the house and then in the garage. And then she said, my garage is not big enough. So she says, Lord, what should I do? And she sold her house. Who would do that? She sold her house and said, Lord, give me a bigger house, not for me, but that I can have more people to pray and to be baptized. And God helped her, got a phone call, got a bigger house, and then 200, and then 250 people. Soon enough, over 200 people got baptized. And then she continued, and the story continues. But when they ask her, why would you do that? She says, I love him more than anything. I love him that I am ready to die for him. So to, do my, to give my house is nothing. And then she says, listen carefully, it is because I deeply coast, listen carefully, it is because I deeply tasted the Lord's love which the world cannot perceive. It is because I deeply tasted the Lord's love that the world cannot perceive, that I am joyfully sacrificing my house and everything, and I can hardly wait to see him face to face. Do you understand what people do when they understand the cross? Seeing the cross is going to change you, change your heart, transform you, fill you with God's love, fill you with God's presence, and give you power to reach others that otherwise you would never reach. Not only that it changes you, then it's using you to change others because the love of God has the power to change the world. And if we miss something and if we miss power, it's because we yet don't understand the cross. I pray that God helps us not to be only theoretical Christians, but to experience, to taste a drop of his love, to experience his love, to see the cross. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, how can we ever understand what Jesus has, died, has done, what you have done in giving your son for us, for me, for each one here, for each one that is listening? How can we grasp that? Please open our hearts, open our eyes, open our minds that we may grasp a drop of the Calvary, that we may understand a little of how much you love us, and that we may be touched and transformed and be filled with your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.